Hi, welcome to Here to Them, hosted by Carolyn Takeda, former attorney, current small groups pastor, and life coach. Through monthly conversations with pastors, authors, and guests, we hope to stir your thoughts and encourage you to move from where you are to where you want to be, in your personal life, in your leadership, or in your ministry. Well, welcome to Group Talk. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carolyn Takeda, your host and the executive director of small groups at Calvary Community Church in Westlake Village, California. Well, as we wind down 2016, one of the things you might be doing, if you haven't already, is evaluating your small group's ministry for this year. But then how do you measure success, or in more spiritual terms, how do you measure the fruitfulness of this ministry? Uh, What metrics do you use? How do you decide what metrics to use? We all can agree that we want our small group's ministry to help bring people to Jesus, to make disciples, to grow people in their relationship with God and with others. But how do we measure these qualitative goals? And then what criteria do we use um, for the goals we set? And then how do we decide whether they've been met? All of these questions are so important to a healthy small groups ministry, but they're kind of squishy and a little hard to do. And so often these qualitative and quantitative metrics tend to be a neglected area because it is challenging. Um, and to put numbers on it may even seem unspiritual in some church circles. To address this critical and complicated issue, I am thrilled to have as our guest, Bill Willits from North Point Community Church, with Senior Pastor Andy Stanley, of course. This is a highly influential church with an incredibly intentional small groups ministry, and Bill has been the leading architect for many years. Bill, thank you so much for being on the program. Carolyn, it's thrilled to be with you. So I'm going to ask you out of the box, how many years has it been since you've been part of North Point and shaping that church? Yeah, so we just celebrated our 21st anniversary, so uh, I've been here since the beginning, so it's been a pretty fun ride to see. It's, you know, we're getting at the age as a church that I'm starting to feel like my parents, you know? (laughs) Being anywhere for 21 years isn't something that I considered myself to be a part of, and now I have been, and it's kind of like, I just had a very monumental high school reunion, Oh wow! and I went back to that, and I went, oh my gosh, I'm my <laughs> parents' age. Terry and I just celebrated our 30th anniversary. Oh, congratulations. And I, you know, so I'm, I guess my point is, is that I am coming to uh, terms with my own mortality. You and I both. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, this is an interesting point. Being somewhere for a long time actually helps with the whole metrics thing because you actually set goals and you're around to see them be met or not met, right? So it's actually a good point. Well, I think it really helps you understand how you define success or define the, the win. And if you do it systematically or if you do it just haphazardly and you learn by trial and error over time, you know, is that sure. really, really an indicator of anything important or is it uh, just a nice to know piece of information? And that's always the tension when it comes to the issue of metrics, because right. what I think what happens with um, I think the misnomer about metrics many times is that, yeah, that's just for. Uh, our administrators, that's just for the people who are working, particularly when it comes to budgets and comes to finances. But I think there's a place uh, on the ministry side of right. it as well, because if you don't measure something, you really can't measure uh, manage something effectively, I don't think so. Right. Okay, well, let's hold that thought, because I just jumped ahead of uh, us. When you said 21 years, it kind of got me thinking about how people don't stay very long, and you really don't ever see um, goals realized or um, shaped by the culture. Yeah. So I have to go back up a little bit. Most of you probably do know who Bill is, but just in case you do not, Bill well, it's, is Executive Director of Ministry Environments for North Point Ministries. North Point Ministries is the parent organization of six Atlanta our churches. Wow, you guys have six now, uh, including North Point Community Church, which is the the main one, and then as well as 23 strategic partners um, around the world. And Bill is one of the founding staff members, as you just said, um, of North Point and the architect of its small group ministry model. He's also the co-author of the book, Creating Community, that he wrote with Andy Stanley. That was actually, Bill, one of the first books I read when I started in small groups ministry uh, about 11 years ago, Um, and it was super helpful then, and it's still, I just saw it on someone's list of must-read for small group pastor. So I would, I would echo that for sure. Um, Bill's passion for community along with his team has helped them connect over 80,000 children, students, and adults into the benefits of group life. Good grief. That's a lot of people. Well, <laughs> it's been, it's been quite a ride. That's for sure. And Bill, of course, is also, um, is kind of what's considered, and there's only a few people I would consider this way, an expert to the experts. Um, there's a handful of people that we have benefited from in small group 
ministry world, and you have been such a um, a generous mentor to a lot of us and a lot of small group pastors over the years. So I'm especially happy to have you here. Okay, now that we've gotten through the the why you're here part, okay, so let's dive in um, to this topic of metrics. I, because of my legal background, I really like facts and numbers. But I sure. found I found early on in church ministry that people in churches tend to have a love-hate relationship with numbers. On the one hand, we do care how many people worship with us. We do care how many are baptized and how many are in groups and serve and all of those things, right? Like the administrative stuff somewhat. But then there's also seems to be this tension about feeling a little apologetic almost or guilty or like kind of poo-pooing the the less quantitative measures and not wanting to talk about budgets or talk about how many people actually get connected and stay in groups. Um, Why do you think, do you agree that there is this kind of love-hate tension? No no, no question. Uh, For the first six years out of college, I worked for Procter & Gamble and I was in sales management. And so I've felt it on both sides of the fence. On the one side, coming into ministry from the business community, I've I felt like there was this mystery shroud that covered over (laughs) ministry. How do we know we're being effective? Yes. And so what we would do is we tend to look at uh, buildings, budgets, and baptisms is what we used to call them. The three Bs. The three Bs. (laughs) And those were kind of the indicators. And let's be honest. We've seen uh, when people have talked about numbers in particular of whatever it is, We've just seen um, a lot of hubris that has come Mm -hmm. with that at times. And so it has just been a total turnoff because it has been about um, what we would uh, all quickly say sometimes artificial indicators rather than real indicators of what's happening. And that's what I want to say about uh, metrics. Metrics are one indicator. They're not the only indicator of what's going on in the, the life of a church. And I think that's important to know. But I do think... We fear them unnecessarily because many times we just don't know what are the right metrics or the most important things to be measuring. Uh, and so we just run away from it. And hopefully we can provide some clarity through this broadcast today. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Um, when you're looking at what metrics to measure, what's the criteria, the filter you use? Well, I, I think one of the things that's really important is that it is just having a mindset uh, of what one thing I said earlier, and that is metrics really do take the mystery out of ministry. There is ministry, there is mystery in ministry. Um, sometimes our effectiveness is pretty cryptic and we really <laughs> don't know. How do we know if somebody's actually growing in their walk with Jesus? That's a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. And then, and then sometimes progress when we do try to lean into a direction it gets overblown or it's it's quite nebulous. It's just anecdotal. It's not right. really factual. So metrics to me provide benchmarks for uh, the results you're trying to achieve. In other words, they clarify the standards. They normalize activity. They help you understand where you are so you can actually take steps as to where you want to go. So uh, I just wanted to say real quickly that metrics for me are so important because I came into ministry thinking if it's all anecdotal um, and it's all based on one person's um, opinion, right? Then how do we really know if we're making any progress? So I think the fact that they provide benchmarks are really important. Um, but again, as I said, I think earlier, is they are de- they are indicators, but not sole determinants. I think that's a real important thing to go. Okay, so good dashboards or good uh, metrics. What are some good things? Well, I think that uh, metrics have to be tied to what you have identified as your clear wins and your critical factors of success. For, your, um, for the specific ministry, so like for that pers- specific ministry. So, for example. Uh, and every one of our ministry dashboards, and I'm going to use small groups as an example of that. Right. We have a mission statement that is clearly articulated for what that um, ministry is all about. But then we've identified as what are the measurable wins that help us understand if we're really making progress. Now, the reason why this is so important is because everybody who's leading a ministry area wants to win. Sure. Nobody got into this to be mediocre. Nobody got, <laughs> in, got into ministry to simply tread water. They really wanted to see progress 
take place in the lives of people. And there are things that we can identify that we would say are helpful steps. Now, they're not complete indicators. Sure. If a person is growing, but we do know if for let's use connection as an example, if, if a person is not known uh, by a few and intentionally committing um, um, to walk through life with other people speaking into their life, we know that they can live in self-deception. They can live sure. in a way that is not challenging or encouraging them to grow in their walk with Jesus. So we know connection is critically important for a person's spiritual formation. So why wouldn't we measure how effective are we at getting people into our small group processes? That's a key indicator. So here are some of our measurable wins okay. when it comes to small groups. So uh, obviously basic Participation. So people participation is one of our measurable wins. Another is the fact that disconnected people are now getting connected for the first time. So you identify, uh, you identify who um, new people getting connected. Is that what you mean by disconnected? That's right. So we ask people on the front side, we ask them, um, are you currently in any kind of small group? And one of the things that we want to do, we're a unique kind of church because we, um, in the sense of, we have a passion for evangelism and partnership uh, using our weekend services, but we want people to continue to take steps, not just uh, we we say it this way: circles are better than rows. Now, rows are the you know we've point. we've all uh, adopted that line, by the way. <laughs> That's and, great. And once in a while, in fact, two guests recently I said that, and I'm like, are we giving Bill any credit for this? <laughs> no, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Um, circles are better than the, rows. Yes. But the but the whole idea. The row is the starting point, but it's not the end point. So how do we continue to help people uh, take next steps? So one of the measurements that we actually have for our service programming team, our weekend worship service team, is the number of next steps people are taking out of the worship service. Hmm. It's a key indicator of their success because their goal is not just to have people show up. It's also to make sure that we're mobilizing them to take next steps. So for us in groups – People participating, disconnected people getting connected. Leaders replacing themselves is a huge piece for us because our leader pool really comes out of an apprentice pool. And then last one is leader retention. Um, How effective are we at pouring into developing coaching, uh, walking with our leaders so that this is a win-win proposition. It's not just a ministry to go do, right. but it's also a ministry that they're experiencing for themselves. You know, when you talked about benchmark, I do I do believe that one of the benefits of having some sort of a metric a system in a non in an intentional way is that then you can measure it year by year. Because um, sometimes that information seems more helpful to see trajectory of ministry. Like, yes, we want the wins, but sometimes ministry is so slow sometimes. Yes, um, and so. You know, I'm curious, how many of these measurements uh, were you paying attention to in year one or year two? Or did you develop them over time? Or how did this come about? Great question. Yeah, the great question. Wondering, I've always, and again, part of it is because I was in such a metric world when I was in my previous life, as I like to call it, (laughs) on the business side, um, has been an important piece. But asking the right Questions and coming up with the right metrics has been certainly an evolutionary process. I would not say other than pure participation numbers and leader numbers, we looked at uh, metrics quite seriously in the first three to five years of our church. I mean, we were um, experiencing pretty rapid growth, and so we were really coming up with our systems Mm -hmm. in the first five years. But after that, we started asking ourselves, are these systems becoming effective? And that's when we looked at what I would call both qualitative and quantitative measurements. Okay, so we have measurable wins. I gave you the four measurable Mm -hmm. wins. But then we have gauges that tell us Hmm. about each of those measurable wins. So, for example, we identified the measurable wins. Then we said, okay, one of the gauges that's going to help us understand is what is just the total number year over year that we have uh, people participating? That's an indication of have sure. we made it easy for people to take a step. Then we do a comparison. And again, there's nothing magical about this comparison, but we look at group participation versus worship service participation oh. as a percentage. 
And so we're just wondering, you know, if um, let's say we have 100 people in worship, what percentage of those um, attendees, and we're not actually asking raw numbers because we know that attendance patterns have changed through the years. Yeah, it's you about know, one out of four for us in California. What is it for you in one Atlanta? Out of four with us. Seriously? I, mean, I would probably, think. Yeah, we were two out of four, and we're somewhere between one and two out of four. Online, our online service has really created an avenue wow. to stay connected, but let's be honest, it's also yeah. created a way for them to get content without having to come. To, to experience the congregation. So, wow. but groups versus worship attendance has been an indication. Then we also ask a gauge of participant satisfaction. So we do a survey every year oh. of our group leaders. And if you go to, uh, if you want this survey, I yes. think it's, <laughs> if they go to inside uh, northpoint.org, there is a section for the various ministry areas and under ministries is groups and in groups. I think that survey exists. Oh, that's but, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, but that helps us understand um, the actual group participants' um, uh, satisfaction level, which we, we have felt has been a huge piece. Leader retention is another gauge that we look at because I want to know, do we have at a particular campus maybe an area where we're not investing into our leaders to the level that we're seeing a lot to about prematurely. So this metric gives me an opportunity to say, whether it's in married groups or men's groups, right. or men's groups or whatever, uh, macroly as well as at a campus level, um, how effective are we in retaining our volunteers? What, what do you think is the typical retention rate that a kind of, you know, you do other consulting and other speaking and stuff in general, uh, with North Point and outside of North Point, what do you think is the typical retention rate for uh, leaders? Yeah, see, I think if you are losing more than 20% of your leaders at any given time. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's low. So I think 80% retention that's pretty good. is a good barometer. Oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> yeah, so anything north of 80, in my estimation, is good because you live, we all live uh, in unique markets. In our case, we live in a metropolitan area that's very transient. Yeah, yeah. So we did a survey some uh, probably about five or six years ago in terms of really the transient nature of our demographic. And we realized that somewhere around 10 percent of our attendees, we can't do anything about. Sure. Uh, yeah, job relocations, the things happen. Right. Yeah, we they have that. Carry, too. They move. They yeah, sure. whatever the case may be. That that there's a shift in in in. Uh, uh, there's a transient nature into our community. So I think anything north of 80, 85 percent is pretty healthy. That's good. Now, I think if we start seeing getting down into 60s, then I think, you know, uh, low 70s, I think we need to ask some questions about what's not happening at that particular ministry or in that particular sure. um, campus. Which is the other benefit of having um, measurement is that you, it identifies the problem spots, um, right. areas where maybe coaching needs to happen more frequently or where somebody needs more care, or whether to, you know, if they're going through some difficult life thing and so kind of they, they dip, participation dips for a while. I, I, that's the other reason I like the numbers because I think it gives us better tools for shepherding our um, people. Yes. Another gauge we use is participant retention. If people aren't yes. staying connected in group life, and I mean this is the actual participants, if we see a trend line start to tube out where people are just in for one group, uh, in our case, and then after two years or three years they go on and stay out of group life, that's, that's been an indication of their experience mm -hmm. to, to us. And then it allows us, either by ministry or by campus, to ask some important questions um, about what didn't happen in that group experience. Because every group's not going to gel. Sure, sure. Every group's not going to have the same level of relationship. We understand that. But we want to minimize that as much as possible. And to your point, when you know what the retention of your participation level is, then you can either identify, hey, we must be okay over here, or warning, we've got an issue that we need to pay attention to. And what would be your thumbnail on that one? What percentage you think is, is typical just life stuff of people, um, you know, going in and out of groups? And what percentage, at what point would you start to ask those questions? 
the, the, the hesitancy that I have right now is really because you've got to, what happens if somebody moves into a different kind of group? Oh yeah. They still, they still are sure. embodying the value of community, but it may not just be one of your groups. Oh, so you have to catch yeah. those numbers too. So we, we, part of our survey did show us that there is about a 15 to 20 percent factor where people are actually in a group. It could be a work related group. It could be a men's accountability mm-hmm. group that came through something else. It's not one of our groups, but right. they're in the right. community. So we came to find out that there's a 15 to 20 percent factor or where the value of community has translated it's just not translating into one of our groups. Which is fine. So, <laughs> it is. It really is fine. Um, we're not paid on a per head basis anyway. So, uh, wow, you'd be so rich if that were the case, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, take that 20, per, if, t- let's say it's 15%. Take that 15% number out so we know that's not going to be retained. So we're down to 85%. And then I just think there's a normal seasonal thing. For example, parents of teens. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> We know are a harder demographic for us to reach than singles or young couples who are just starting right. out or right. empty nesters. Because we're so have. busy. <laughs> That's right, because there's just so much going on. So um, our stats show that about one in two parents of teens are in a small group. Hmm. So we do some unique things to oh, attack that demographic uh, to make it more attractive for them to cluster together to navigate the season yes. uh, together. So, uh, but again, knowing that right. right through your data helps you identify what are the hot spots that you can pay attention to. So, participant attend- retention is a key piece. Then the last one is huge for us, and it really sh- demonstrated a problem area for us this last year. And it was around apprenticing. Apprenticing is you know, basically years ago, uh, it, there's nothing new in the sun, and, and <laughs> our friends um, who have influenced this would have been many, many um, you know, really made a challenge to us that I thought was really important. You know, as a staff person, I can be responsible for enlistment, or I can take the 3,000 small group leaders that I have and make them partners with me in the enlistment process. Right. And what right. the apprentice thing does, and what we found is, We need leaders to identify potential apprentices. We'll develop them, but they need to do the identification with us. And generally, when that happens, we don't have a leader pool shortage. When we get weak on the apprentice, the percentages of groups with apprentices, then we tend to have a leader shortage. So, for example, two years ago, I'm looking at our dashboard. And I'm noticing a trend line that we've moved from 35 and 40 percent of our groups with apprentices down to 20 percent of our groups. And I'm hearing this clarion call. We don't have enough leaders. We don't have enough right. leaders. Well, again, having this on a dashboard helped us identify as specifically some of the newer campuses that did not have the apprentice value as part of their DNA. So we then started paying attention and we made a short term goal of thinking through our apprentice strategy. Part of that said, okay, we can identify, uh, we can get group leaders to identify potential apprentices and then we'll take them through the application process and through the interview process. But we have to make the commitment for development because if we make the commitment for development, then it becomes something that the group leader feels they can partner with us on. What we were doing previously is we were asking leaders to not only influence, provide opportunities for them to apprentice, but also fully develop them. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and, and it just wasn't happening. It wasn't scalable for us. So what we said, okay, now leaders identify an apprentice. We'll, we'll do some unique trainings for them to help ramp them up. Then as a leader, you provide them opportunities through the life cycle of your group to help them develop some of these leader skills. But what you can most importantly do to help us is identify who are those prospects. Right. Well, seeing our numbers go up, um, and and we're actually trying to uh, grow at 2x uh, this coming year, 
because when we paid attention to it, hmm. which the dashboard told us, <laughs> we started to see change. And then we started to see more people being identified as a result, more people brought into the game. Wow. Of That's a great example of how the, the metrics and the dashboard really helps you um, clarify. Yeah. Our failure. Anything, anything <laughs> use our failure to uh, demonstrate, I'm happy to, Carol. <laughs> Well, you have, you fixed it really fast, so that becomes the falling forward concept. <laughs> yeah, now there you go. There you go. But one thing I would say, and I do this on all of our ministry dashboards and groups not exempt, is I think, you know, dashboards must measure quantitative data. It must measure qualitative. So what's the overall satisfaction uh, rate? And so we do that through our surveys. But I think dashboards should also contain something else. I think they should contain stories huh. because numbers move our heads but stories move our hearts yes. and so on every ministry dashboard i love to see a story coming out of a campus or a small group or whatever the case may be that helps us understand in a fresh way where it's working and whom it's impacting and what kind of impact is it really having and um, i think many times we can just get lost in the weeds with the numbers which are good and important indicators, and we could forget the stories are why we got into ministry. Right, right. This life change uh, are, are, is what we really are about. And so how do we, in the midst of data, get back to um, the storylines of people's journeys? And so you so, actually ask them for the story then? Is that how you collect that data? Yes. Yeah, so for every ministry, we ask them, give me one story from this past reporting period that really indicated you were making progress because we never wanted data to be the only indicator, sure. but we did want it to have a seat at the table. And honestly, the thing that's always the most uh, encouraging and motivating and inspiring are those stories where, where if it's an adult, where they were far from God sure. and they to know Jesus personally, and then they began their journey. That's what motivates us for a kid when they, you know, discover for the first time because of a broken family that they have a heavenly father that's nothing like their imperfect father. Right. They have a perfect heavenly father. Those kinds of things. And uh, so it's almost I, operates as a checks and balances of sorts, right? Because initially we were talking about how the, the riskiness of taking anecdotes or stories yes. in the lobby or whatnot. You know, you hear one story and then you go, wow, small groups is going great for all 50 groups. But you don't know that. You only heard one story of one group. The That's other right. groups may not be really doing much of anything, but, you know, sitting around. So it kind of bounces out on the flip side, though. You could have fantastic numbers and have, you know, 80% of your weekend attenders in a group. But without the story and without next measuring next step movement, whether right. I'm assuming some of your next steps are probably related to serving, baptism, and uh, yes. and ministry, that, that type of thing, or evangelism, then you don't know if there's actually any forward momentum in those groups too. So it seems like having the qualitative, quantitative have to go together along with, I would say, the stories of the spiritual component. Um, they, they really are. And, and they're the things that give you lift. They're the things that really motivate you back into why we got into this to begin with. Because none of us got into ministry for <laughs> spreadsheets. Okay. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, okay. <laughs> Unless there you're a little sick people, in some way. <laughs> there are certain people who did get into ministry for spreadsheets and they tend to be on the administrative side uh, and the business side. And we're grateful for them because we all right. love to uh, um, live and eat indoors. So that's great. <laughs> we're, it, it, as I like to say to our business administrator, you giveth and I taketh away. Okay. But, <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, what, what really motivates us is when we actually see Jesus becoming real to people's lives, and then they're emboldened to take the next step that God wants them to on their journey with Him. Right. And we only have a couple minutes left, Phil. I want to circle back to this really important thing, because um, what about the people who think measuring any numbers is kind of not spiritual? The Holy Spirit is at work in our groups, and people are coming to know Jesus more, and that's enough for us. We don't need to sit there and really figure out exactly how many people took next steps or how many people are staying in the group or leaders are being retained. What about kind of people with that sort of mindset? Sure. And, and, and I think many times it's because they've had too an exhaustive approach. Start with three measurements, just three okay. measurements and make it easy for you 
but identify what are our wins? What do we really want to see happen quantitatively? And then what can we measure qualitatively? I think that, you know, so have a couple of quantitative and maybe one qualitative that gives you an, an indication. But I think, um, and not to be cliche-ish, but um, <laughs> numbers matter because people count at the end of the day. And we are having a unique privilege to be able to walk with people on their spiritual journeys. We should know if people are taking next steps on their journey with Jesus. I mean, at the end of the day, the reason we want to get people into small groups is because what community does is it provides courage. Okay. Um, my wife has come up with this statement and it's so good. You know, courage comes in community. Hmm. And I believe that is so true because what do we want? We want to challenge one another, stir one another up in love sure. and good deeds to a way that we're not the same people because of being in this group. And so, uh, our metrics allow us again, qualitative and quantitative, to understand what actually is happening in the lives of our groups. Because we make a promise to the people in our groups. And the promise is, is that if you go into this group, you're going to experience something you can't from being isolated from that kind of group experience. Right. And the question is, are we fulfilling our promise at the end of the day? I think it's incumbent upon us as ministry leaders to be able to know, not fully, 100% of the time, but trajectory, right. that more time than not, this is happening. And if it's not, then we're being able to realize that and taking the corrective measures necessary uh, to, do other, to, to do something different. Yeah, I completely agree. I think I love that, um, the idea of it gives people courage. I think it takes courage for us as whether we're staff or lay leaders in charge of the small group ministry. It takes guts to take a good look, an honest look at numbers, um, because they not be what we want them to be. And it, and the temptation to kind of blur it or to creatively explain it away, uh, it, that's not helpful for the, the sacred trust that our people have given us, which is that we are promising as a church and as a ministry that we're going to help people move forward in their relationship with Jesus. So I, I absolutely agree with you. This is such a great conversation because we're so in agreement. Next time we'll talk about something, Bill, where, you know, we can... Where it's like, a little bit more spicy. Yes, where we could duke it out. But this one, I, I do think is so important. Um, and if we want change to happen, then we have to have the courage to, to take a look at what is going on. One other thought real quick, and, and I would just say this, whenever we establish metrics, don't establish them for people allow the people to come up with their own metrics. Okay. Uh, and the reason is, is because you want ownership. You want shared ownership of those metrics. So if I come in, let's just say for our children's ministry and come up with what their metrics are, mm -hmm. they have no ownership in it. But if I say, okay, what are your measurable wins? They identify them. What are the key indicators or the gauges we're going to look at? They identify them. Then there's a sense of ownership that they have. And I think in groups, we should do that. And maybe in some cases, uh, bring in group leaders to be able to speak into how do we define success? What should be our measurable wins? What are the quantitative and qualitative uh, measurements that we should pay attention to? And then allow them to craft whatever the questions may be to our surveys or what uh, the data points that we're going to look at so that there, it's a collaborative effort and there's a sense of shared ownership. Oh, that's a great point. And then also, but would, would you agree that some of your metrics at, would have to be aligned with the greater church goals? So you're yes. not your own little island off there, but um, I'm, I'm positive that the goals that you set on your dashboard for every ministry probably aligns with North Point's overall ministry philosophy and vision. And it's constantly a having and challenging people to take whatever the next step, appropriate next step is for them on their journey with Jesus. And engagement, further engagement in the life of the church is an indicator. And you mentioned that we talk a lot about engagement, small groups. How do we know if we're making success? Well, personally, we want people to take a step. Relationally, we want people to connect in a group. Corporately, we want people to further engage. And we call engagement around connection, uh, giving uh, investing into the lives of unbelievers uh, and then inviting them to the appropriate step. And then obviously there's a service component too and sure. jumping in and being part of 
uh, the game and not just in the stands. You're right. And those, um, whatever metrics you develop do align so well with them. I think that's so important too, because you are a part of a larger whole, um, our yes. churches. And so make sure that whatever metrics you develop, they line up with senior leadership. <laughs> oh, if you want to yeah. succeed, have any chance of success, make sure that's happening. <laughs> and longevity, we might add. And let's add, let's go back to that. Yes. Long, if you like your job and like the view outside your window, which, which uh, Bill has a lovely tree course. outside. That's right. <laughs> Well, Bill, thank you so much for this conversation. It was super helpful. I really appreciate your time. Great to be with you, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Here to There, part of the Group Talk Network of Podcasts. If you like what you've heard, make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. If you want to learn more, make sure you check out smallgroupnetwork.com for more resources.